Give them worship and praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, can you lift your hands with me all over the room in adoration? God, we're open. We're ready. We're thankful for what you're doing in our spirit and our lives, how you're getting us ready and prepared for what's next. We thank you for how you're strengthening our resolve in you so that we can receive the revelation that you have for our lives. Help us continually, God. Let our inside match our outside. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Point all the way down your row and say triggers, 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 triggers. We're in this series of triggers and we're being developed in the month of October. Today we're going to talk about entitlement. Mm. I know. That's what we said when we were studying it. Entitlement, entitlement. And we're going to deal with a parable, a story that Jesus talked about. Last week we talked about parables and the story Jesus dealt with in the book of Luke, the 15th chapter, the 12th verse uh, through 14 right here. It says, and the younger one, talking about the prodigal son, and the younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. It's interesting how we have a generation that want promotion that never been processed. His father said, verse 13, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off on a distant country. There he squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he had spent everything, ain't that a shame? There was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. He began to be in need. He started off having all of his needs met. He'd make a demand on something that belongs to him, but he asked for it prematurely, and then he finds himself in a place of need when the famine hit. How many of you know that you serve a God that does not want you to run out? I, I didn't hear nobody. I, I, you ought to declare, I will not run out. I will not run. Come on, you ought to say, I got everything I need. I got everything I need. And the only thing God wants us to do is be a steward of everything he has prepared for us. And so to properly steward the supply, to properly steward the supply that God has for us, we have to learn not to have a spirit of entitlement. Why do people feel entitled? Why do people feel entitled? The first thing that people use in entitlement is their age. Your age can make you feel entitled, and that's both young and old. Young, you feel like because you went to school, because you had the education, because you got to do it. The education equals experience. And where education is great, it's not necessarily experience. You need both education and experience. And, and so young people can, can sometimes have the education and then they fight for entitlement. Older people can have entitlement because they feel like they've been here longer than everybody else. Now that's my seat right there. You understand what I'm saying? I was here, I was, I was sitting in that seat when you was born. Hallelujah. And, and it's interesting because we have to be careful uh, that age don't make us feel entitled. The other thing that makes you feel entitled is your position. He's a son. He's a son. So his position puts him in a seat or a space of entitlement. If you're not careful, you will allow your position to put you in a place of entitlement. I'll get back to all this. The third thing that can let you feel entitled is expectation. Give me my share of the estate. Give me my share of the estate. It's not that it doesn't belong to you. It's that is it yours time? Right? Because there's a difference between, between having something that's yours before it's time. How many of you don't want anything for it that God has for you before it's time? I mean, I know that's, that sounds different. But I don't want anything that God has for me before it's time for me. And if you're not careful, you'll allow people and pressure to put pressure on, uh, on timing, on the timing of God. And you'll find yourself needing to trust the timing of God. Can you say it to yourself? I trust the timing of God. I trust the timing of God. I am where I'm supposed to be. I am in what I'm supposed to be in. And I trust the timing of God. All things are working together for my good. Now, where does this spirit of entitlement come from? It, it, it comes, the spirit of entitlement doesn't come from outside, it comes from inside. 
We're going in so my inside matches my outside. Spirit of entitlement comes from inside. A spirit of entitlement is a fruit of jealousy. It's a fruit of jealousy. Jealousy is the source, and entitlement is the symptoms. Entitlement is the, ex the, the exterior of the fruit of jealousy. There's a feeling that you can have of jealousy, and then jealousy has a behavior. So just because you can feel jealous, you can take the jealousy, you can control it, but if you don't control the jealous behavior, the jealous feeling, the jealous feeling will turn into a jealous behavior. And, and, and the jealous behavior comes from, from this, this spirit of, of what I say, agitated worry. So you get jealous when you get worried, when you're agitated and you're worried and you start comparing and you start looking around and you start comparing yourself to other people and where they are. It's silent. It's quiet. You don't tell nobody you feel jealous. Y'all want to be honest today. You don't tell nobody that you feel a kind of way, but you feel that thing rising up and your Holy Ghost be like, jealous, jealous, jealous. Be like, I got to push that down. I got to push that down because I don't want to covet. I don't want to want anything that somebody else has. And I can't be worried about if I'm keeping up with them because if I'm worried about if I have everything else that I'm supposed to have, I start looking at what other people have and I start feeling a certain kind of way and I got to pull that thing in check. And so jealousy is angry or agitated worry, and it comes from these things, expectation that you feel like you're owed something. When you feel jealous, it's because you feel like you owe something that you don't have yet. It comes from an internal sense of emptiness, this place where I feel like I'm missing something in my life. When I feel like I'm missing something, by this time I said I would be here. By this age, I would said I would be here. I should possess this, and I start looking on Instagram and social media and watching other people uh, highlight reels, and I stop being thankful for the journey that God brought me on because I start comparing myself to other people, and I feel like I'm missing something. And then entitlement is a jealous behavior because it feels like you have the right for something. I have the right to this. This ain't, you ain't doing me no favors. Give me what belongs to me. I got a right to it. And if you're not careful, having a right to something will put you in this sense of a spirit of entitlement that is rooted in a spirit of jealousy. Come on, say amen. James, the fourth chapter, says it like this. James 4 and 3 says, when you ask for something, when you ask for something and you do not receive it, it's because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it what you get on your own pleasures. So God says, some things you've been asking for, I didn't give it to you because you don't know what you're going to do with it because you won't do with it what I need you to do with it and you'll spend it wrong. And if you spend it wrong or you use it wrong, then you'll need it later. So I don't give it to you when you ask until you know what to do with it. Anybody can look back over your life and can be thankful that God didn't do it when you wanted them to do it. Come on, where the honest people at? And can you clap your hands and give God a praise and say, I'm glad he made me wait. I'm glad. Come on, that's a mature praise. That's a mature prayer. I'm glad he made me wait. There was some stuff that had he did it when I said he should have did it, I wouldn't even have it right now. But because he made me wait until my inside matched my outside, I can manage my manifestation. Clap your hands and give God another praise. I'm glad he made me wait. I'm glad he made me wait. Now, now that's, a, that, that's a position of maturity because there's a lot of people that can't celebrate when God makes you wait. When God makes you wait, when God makes you wait. And so they say, here's what I'm going to do when I don't get what I want. Here's what I'm going to do when I don't get what I want. The first thing that they do is they make it happen. Say, oh, you're not going you, you to help me? I'm going to make it happen. I know how to do it. I'm gonna, I know how to get what I want. I'm going to make it happen. Luke, the 15th chapter, 12th verse says, the younger one said to his father, this is his age, the younger one says to his father. So it's out of order because the older one's supposed to get the inheritance. So he's like, forget my older brother. I'm the younger one, but I'm going to get in front of my older brother, and I'm going to put a demand prematurely on something that I want and I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to force my father's hand because of my relationship even though my age is younger I'm going to make it happen. And you have to be careful when, when you try to make things happen out of time because when you try to make things happen out of time it has long lasting consequences. Uh, it has long lasting consequences. Your choices of making something last happen out of time can impact you longer than when you're alive. 
Uh, in Genesis, the 16th chapter, Abraham and Sarah had a promise from God. They didn't want to do it God's way because it was taking too long. So they said, I'm going to help God. <laughs> I'm going to help God help me since God take it too long to help me. Then I'm going to help God. And Sarah said, I got a bright idea. What you can do is you can go and lay with my handmaiden and you can have this child. And so the Bible says that, 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 that she uh, went, he went and laid with the handmaiden uh, so that they can obtain a child by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. He listened to her. He said, well, if you want me to sleep with her, I guess I can if that's the plan of God, hallelujah. I guess, I guess if you, if you want me to do that, I guess I'll do it. And, and he ends up laying, and instead of having, having Isaac, he has Ishmael. And Ishmael now is the child that they birth, that they have to manage and maintain, even though it wasn't the purpose or the plan of God. And anytime you try to make something happen, you'll end up having to take care of something that God never wanted you to take care of. You'll, you'll end up having to, to, to nurture something that God never meant for you to nurture and you'll end up having to manage something that God never wanted you to manage and even though God still is going to make good on his promise he's still going to do what he promised you to do but now you also got to take care of something else that you did on top of what God did Woo! and it has lasting effects you know the, the war between Palestine and Israel that's taking place now it's simply the war between two brothers. It's simply Ishmael and Isaac still fighting. Abraham's gone, but Ishmael and Isaac is still fighting over what belongs with them because when you try to make something happen, you'll be long gone. And, and, and what you try to make happen will still be fighting. You'll get that later. Tell, tell your neighbor, tell them, don't make it happen. Don't try to make it happen. Don't try to make it happen. Trust God. Don't try to make it happen. If God promised it, if God said it, anybody believe God can do everything he promised? Come on, can you clap your hands and say, I trust the timing of God. Second thing that happens is if your age don't get you, the position will. If the age don't get you, you got to watch that age. If the age don't get you, the position will. Uh, the position of trying to get you to stop it from happening or stop something from happening. The younger one said to his father, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the, the estate. The, the position will put you in a position where you try to manipulate. He puts a premature demand on his promise from his father. He puts a premature demand on his promise. He says, give me what belongs to me. It's mine, but give it to me now. You attempt, when your age is involved, you attempt to use your relationship. You attempt to use your relationship or your history as manipulation. You, att you, attempt to, you attempt to use the length of time as a way to manipulate to get what it is that you want or you desire. Give me what already belongs to me, even if I'm not ready for it. Give me what's mine, even if it might destroy me because I put a demand on what belongs to me. You you, you put a demand on it premature. I've been with you for a long time. I knew you before. I knew you when. I knew you when nobody knew you. I, I knew you before. Oh, now, now you want to act different. No, no, no. It's just that we're evolving. And just because you had history with me means you have to evolve with me. Because if you don't evolve with me, you can't use your history against me. We got history. If you're, not, if you're not careful, you'll put a premature demand on it. You'll stop it from happening or stop something from happening or stop it from happening with other people. Watch out for people that, that try to act like they're protecting you, but they really, they, they're really protecting uh, uh, your opportunity to grow. They're really pro they're, they act like they're close to you, so they're looking out for you. But really, they're killing everybody else that God assigned to help you. No, it's me and you. I, I got your back. You got my back, but, but are you helping anybody else come in? Is this a gated community? Are we in a closed space? Are we allowed for new relationships and new growth? And if you're not careful, people will act like they're close to you. That's really hurting you. <laughs> Judges the 
the 11th chapter talk about Gilgal's wife had, had a son and when his wife's sons grew up, the sons grew up, they drove out Japheth and said to him, thou shalt not inherit your father's house for thou art a son of another woman. He was a son of another woman. The original quote unquote sons tried to block his blessing and say he doesn't have rights to something that belongs to him because he didn't come through the same process. Can I tell you that I don't have to come through your process in order to get what God has for me. That God has many lanes and many ways and just because you just met me don't mean I just got here. Where the people at that know you've been processing a long time before some people meet you and people will try to discount your development just because they wasn't there through your process. Just because you just met me, don't try to disinherit me just because I just got here. God was preparing this moment for me to be here. I'm here now. I need you to look down your road. Say, I'm here now. I'm here now. I'm here now. You can't stop me. You can't block me because what God has for me is for me whether you just met me or not. Where you come from? Where you come from? Where you come from? They try to discredit him. You came through another womb. You came through another womb so you don't get this. But we got the same father. But we got the same father. So just because he sent me through another process, don't discount my development. And if you're not careful... That position will try to block you or get people to block you or people try to block you or people try to stop you. People try to block you. Entitlement comes to try to block you. You put a demand on what belongs to you before you know what to do with it. Before you know what to do with it. And you, you have to be careful because, because, because people expect to receive from things that they haven't given to. Everything gives from what it receives. And, and, and people always expect to receive from things or places they haven't given to. And you know as a spirit of entitlement when you come to try to withdraw from something that you haven't made a deposit in. If you didn't put nothing in, you can't take nothing. My wife and I teach her, teach her with marriage, with marriages, we talk about the marriage box. And we say people try to make withdrawals where they haven't made deposits. You want respect, you got to put respect in so you can take respect out. You want love, you got to put love in so you can take love out. Because if you just keep taking out of something that you never put anything in, it will eventually be dry. People try to take from what they haven't received. They try to take from what they haven't received. They try, to, they try to take from what they haven't given to. They have a take from what they haven't given to. And, and, and then people will stop you. You will stop yourself. Something has to stop it. Something has to either stop it. You stop it. It stops it. Something stops it. Something has to stop this process. Because if you continue to do this, you go down this wrong, this wrong process, this wrong path. And then now you have this, this false expectation. And the false expectation is where you start to, to ask for things to happen for you that, that, that is out of time and out of season. And you have, to, you have to stop it because entitlement will ruin you because it's internal. And if you don't check it, it'll, it'll get you in trouble. You start asking for stuff that belongs to you. You try to make it happen. You only get it because you ask for it, but you're really not ready for it. You, you only get it because you're becoming a nuisance, but you're really not ready for it. You're, you're not ready for it. And you have to be careful because... Because sometimes somebody will give you something, not because they want to, but because they're tired of you bugging them. I'm tired of you asking me. So you're going to keep on asking me? So I'm going to give you what you asked for, even though I probably know that you're not ready for what you asked for. And had you waited, you would have got it a whole different way. But because you try to demand it, I'm going to let you have what you asked for, even if I know you're not ready. I don't know about you, but I want God to put people in my life that will not give in to the pressure that trusts where the honest people that they can say, honestly, I know I can get ahead of myself. My ambition can get ahead of myself. My hunger can get ahead of myself. My, my peers can get me to push ahead of myself. I can get anxious for something and I can get ahead of myself. And I can start putting a demand on stuff that God has for me, but not yet. It takes maturity 
to trust the timing of God. Come on, uncross your arms and lift your hands up and tell the Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Get that stanky face off. Get that stanky look off your face and tell the Lord, yes, Lord, yes. This message cutting you. Check your spirit. Don't look at me. It's the word. I don't want, I don't want what I'm not ready for. I don't want what I'm not ready for. Even if I prayed for it, even if I saw it, even if I know it's mine. I don't want what I'm not ready for. The young one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. Give me what's mine. You're the younger one. So you, something that I, some, something that I, that I say for you for when I die, you won't now. So I'm willing to take care of you while I'm still alive, but you want it. You want what belongs to you when I'm dead. So you rather have me dead. You want me out your life now. I, you want my stuff, but not my mindset. I know you're working hard. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children. I know you're working hard to leave something for your children, but don't give them your money without your mindset. Successive generations usually don't happen because the first generation work really hard, really, really, really hard to get it out the mud. And then the children come with a spirit of entitlement because they don't have the same mentality and they squander everything you worked your life for. Don't work so hard that you give them your money without giving them your mind. Give me. What belongs to me? Ooh, that pride. You got to watch out for pride. Pride is sneaky. Pride will cause you to get what you're not prepared for. Want what you're not prepared for. Pride shows up as confidence. I know what I'm doing. I've been around this all this time. You don't embrace the new learning opportunities because pride will make you, pride won't let you admit that you went over your head. Because you do serve a God that'll give you a dream a few sizes too big so that you have to grow into it. But you have to be willing to say, I have to grow into it and I don't already know what I'm doing. Pride will cause you to want what you don't want, what you're not prepared for. Proverbs 16, 18 says it like this in the Message Bible. Can we read? Read Bible. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego. Y'all ain't reading this Bible up in here. Anytime you see pride, you're a prophet. Anytime you see a pride, you're a prophet. You know what's going to happen next. Pride, the Lord shows me a crash. I see a crash coming. Anytime you see somebody functioning in pride, you know a crash is coming. You might as well start praying for them. You might as well start. Sometimes, sometimes pastor and I talk and we can see some, some behavior. And pastor will say, ooh, I've seen this before. We got to pray. I said, what you talking about? He said, we got to pray. I said, why? He said, because I've seen this before. And I know what's going to happen next. What's going to happen next? A crash. And when the crash happens, when the crash happens, it don't just impact you. When the crash happens, it impacts everybody connected to you. And the bigger the ego, the bigger the fall. And I'd rather God work the pride stuff out of me when nobody knows me, work the pride stuff out of me when no one's connected to me so that if I make a mistake, God, I don't impact those that are connected to me. Come on, lift your hands. Lift your hands and tell the Lord, Lord, I don't want to be prideful. I don't want to be prideful. I don't want to crash. You did better. Some of y'all just, y'all got one hand up. Y'all was like, okay. We almost there. It's yours but you don't know what to do with it. It's yours. But you don't know what to do with it. It's not if it's yours or not. 
It's yours. But you don't know what to do with it. You don't want the promise without the process. Promise, that's why every promise has a contingency connected to it. Because you don't want the promise without the process. It's like premature. You don't want the promotion before you actually produce something. Because if you do, you'll mismanage it. And there's some doors that it takes a lifetime to happen again. Gotta trust the timing. Gotta trust the timing of God. Because if you miss it because you jump prematurely, now you gotta wait. You put a demand on what was his prematurely. Three signs you know that you're not ready for it. Number one, your location. Where am I? Forget where everybody else is. Where am I? Where's my spirit? Where's my heart? Where, where am I? Location. He set off to a distant country. He said, give me, give me my stuff. Thank you, Dad. I'm good. I know what I'm doing. I've been sitting up here watching this all this time. I know how to do what I do. I'm going to show him. You walk different when you think you know what you're doing. And we know you don't know what you're doing because you're walking too hard. Because if you knew what you was doing and you was going a long way, you would pace yourself. Because you know that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Tap your neighbor on the shoulder and say, what you in a hurry for? Come on, tell them the faster you finish, the sooner you die. The faster you finish, the sooner you die. I don't want to hurry up, Lord. Let me be in the perfect time of the Lord. You know you're going on a distant country. You go slow. You don't, you're not in a hurry. Location, where am I? He set off to a distant country. When your location changes, you're distant from the people that love you. First thing the enemy try to do is isolate you. Let me get you away from everybody that loves you. Let me get you away from your mirrors. The people that don't want nothing from you, but they want the best for you. You'll start believing the lies of the people that want to take from you instead of listening to the people that love you. You need to be around people that don't want nothing from you but for you to be you. When you're the best you, they say, I don't want nothing from you. I just want you to be yourself. And the first thing the enemy is trying to do is get you isolated. Stop going to church. Stop calling your friends. Stop going to see your mother. Stop going to see your father. Stop going to see your accountability. Stop going to see the people that can tell when you off. And whenever the enemy is about to try to abuse you, he isolates you. It's domestic violence month. Whenever the abuser tries to isolate, you know he's trying to isolate to separate so he can manipulate, so he can control. If he isolates, separate, manipulate, and control, he got you. Am I off? I used to get up early for prayer. I used to get up early for church. I used to get up early for worship. I used to be the first one in the door. I used to be the first one at work. I used to be the first one there. I was there. I used to be. This ain't my character. I'm out of my I'm off. I'm off. I'm off. I'm out of, I'm in a distant country. I'm far, far away. What drew you out the house? What drew you out the house? What made you leave? What made you leave? Everything was good. What made you leave? Does it say anything was wrong? What made you leave? What drew you out? Who lured you out? Who pulled you out? Who drew you out? What voices did you listen to? What manipulation? What got in your spirit? What, what entered your heart? What entered your mind that caused you to isolate yourself? What made you want your own when, when we got plenty for you to do right here? What made, you, what made you want to get in a space and get involved in a thing where you now want to take something prematurely? It's nothing worse than a parent working hard for their child only for them to grow up and want to leave before it's time for them to leave. Why do you want to have bills so fast? It's ghetto. When I grow up, when I grow up, listen, 
If I had three more months in my mama house, I'd have saved my money different. If I had three more months in my mama house and my daddy house, I would have stacked my coins a little bit different. Why am I in such a hurry to go out and be an adult? Because once you leave, you can't come back. I know you won't leave me. But I refuse to let you go. If I got to beg you, please, don't go. Everybody shout, don't go. Only in America we put our kids out at 18. You don't know, you ain't know nothing at 18. You let the government tell you you was grown at 21. You ain't know nothing at 21. I was overseas. I was overseas talking to one of my friends, and he said, only you Americans put your children out at 18. Send them off to a campus separate from you where they could be controlled and manipulated and inspired by every other thought and doctrine. Cut them off and isolate them. Who does that? Americans. How much better would you be if you had just five more years at your mama house? Knowing what you know now. Oh, you ain't sleeping on the couch. You still working, but you don't have no bills. You don't have no light bill, no gas bill. Man, mama, if you want me to buy, if you want me to take a bill, give me a bill. Give me one bill. I got you. Which one you want me to take? One bill better than all the bills. Isolation. Your location tells you you off. Second thing tells you you off is your surrounding. Look around you. He squandered all his wealth. People get around you to come and suck you dry. I got a preaching church. I had a preach over there and a preach right here. They come and take from you. If everybody around you is taking from you, you're in the wrong space. At some point, you got to be like, wait, wait. Do every conversation want something? You squandered all as well. You get around people who only take from you. Takers. Watch them takers. They take from you, but they never return anything to you. Takers, you know you're around takers because they wish they were you. They have no value of who you are. And they have no sense of what it takes for you to be you. They always take from you, but they have no idea. They couldn't last one day being you. Your surroundings, no accountability, no responsibility. No accountability, no responsibility. If you're a grown person with no accountability and no responsibility, you're acting like a child. Because only children have no responsibility and no accountability. Do you, boo? Don't do you. You got too much to lose now. Do whatever you feel like doing. Don't do whatever you feel like doing. Your feelings going to get you in trouble. You look up and you in surroundings and no accountability, no responsibility, you're in the wrong place. Last one, your spirit. See, all this stuff is inside. Your spirit, you wild. Three, four, five seconds from wilding. Wild living. You doing what you would never do. Have you, what are the honest people that found yourself in a space where you're like, ooh, I thought I, I, thought I was delivered from this. <laughs> How many of you in the pandemic was like, ooh, I thought that was, I thought that was dead. Y'all don't, uh, y'all ain't want to raise your hand. In the pandemic, you were like, oh, I thought I was, I, I thought I was over there. That pandemic showed you what you was working with. You were like, oh, hurry up and get back to church. <laughs> wow, 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 right? 
Can't nobody see you neither. At least you, at least you knew you had to act a certain way because somebody was going to see you at church and they were going to look at you and say, where you been, what you're doing? Can't nobody see you. The spirit is wild. You're out here doing what you said you'll never do. You're acting out of character. People wild out when they believe that everything that has been given to them is for them. When you wild out, you end up in a pig pen. That man end up in a pig pen. What do I mean? Pigs have no preference. Pigs have no preference. They eat whatever you put in front of them. Pigs lay in slop. They live in a mess and they don't even know that they're in a mess. You find yourself living beneath your God-given privileges. You find yourself slipping. Eating slop, fragments. Feeling trapped by your choices and decisions. Till one day... You decide it's your day of deliverance. Come on, somebody else beside me getting delivered from entitlement. Come on. Look at somebody say, today is my day of deliverance. Here's the thing. Guess what? Guess who's going to deliver you? You. Jesus not coming. He not coming. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus like, no, you deliver you. You deliver you. I'm going to say it again. You deliver you. You can't wait. Nobody's coming to rescue you. Nobody's coming to save you. Nobody told you to get yourself in that mess. Nobody sent you there. Nobody asked you to act like that. And nobody's coming to deliver you. But just because nobody's coming to deliver you doesn't mean you can't be delivered. Because there's enough in you to deliver yourself. You can decide today that today is my day. Today is my day of deliverance. And I'm going to deliver myself. I need you to clap your hands and say, I'm delivering myself. I'm, I need you to testify to somebody around you and say, I'm delivered, I'm delivered. Today is my day of deliverance. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm no longer stuck. I'm about to break out. I'm about to get back in my position. I let entitlement to creep up on me. But today is the last day that it'll run rocket in my life. Today is my day of deliverance. If you mean it can you lift your hands and don't be prideful and worship God for 20 seconds if it's in there God get it out if it's in there God get it out get it out if it's in there God get it out if I've been anxious, if I've been jealous, if I've been angry, if I've been agitated, if I've been looking out if, instead of looking in, if I've been in a hurry, if I've been in a rush, if I haven't trusted your timing, if it's in there, get it out. Deliver me. I'm better than this. 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 Testify to somebody, tell them I'm better than this. Tell them you better than this. Y'all ready? Y'all ready for the turn? Y'all ready for the turn? See, everybody ain't ready for the turn because some people are still mad because I told them about themselves. But come on, let's get ready for the turn. Come on, because what's coming for you is better than what you took. How many of you know you serve a God that will restore you as long as you turn? How many of you know that you serve a God that if you repent, he'll restore? It's my day of deliverance. It's my day of deliverance. And he came to his senses. My favorite line in this story is he came to his senses. Tap yourself and say, I'm about to, I came to my senses. Not I'm about to. I came to my senses. I came to my senses. And I realized that God wasn't trying to take nothing from me. He was just trying to prepare me. I came to my senses and I realized that God wasn't trying to stop me. He was just trying to develop me. And I trust the timing of God. After he squandered everything he had and lost what he had, he came to his senses. He said to himself, 
Sometimes you got to talk to yourself. How many of my father's hands servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. The devil is a lie. Living beneath my privilege. My father owns a cattle on a thousand hills. Why am I here struggling when God has already provided everything? God, I trust you. God, I will not live beneath my privileges. Can I get somebody to worship God and come to yourself? He's my daddy. I don't have to take no mess and I don't have to take less. I'm coming to my senses. Sometimes God don't let somebody else give it to you because he want to give it to you. You mad at somebody and God said, had I let them bless you, you would have gave the credit to them. But because they didn't bless you, you let me bless you. And I bless you better than anybody else can bless you. Take 20 seconds, lift up your hands and worship the Father. And he came to himself. And he came to himself. And he came to his senses. How many of my father's hired hands have food to spare? Here I am struggling. It ain't God's will for me to struggle. Here I am struggling because of a self-imposed infliction on myself. Because I couldn't trust the timing of God. And unfortunately, sometimes conversion only comes through a crisis. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't turn until we have a crisis. And God said, I'm going to take that crisis and I'm going to turn it for your benefit. What did he do when he come to himself? He came to his senses, he got up, and he went to his father. I need you to tell three people, come to your senses, get up, and go to your father. Come on, tell three more people, tell them, come to your senses, get up, and go to your father. Quit, quit complaining about it. Don't talk about it, not another day. Push them and tell them, get up, get up, get up. I know it's early in the morning, but get up. I know you're watching online, but get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Come to your senses, get up, and get back to your father. Get back to your father. Get back to your father. He's the only one that can help you. Which was father. When you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you don't allow pride to destroy you. While he was still a long way off, the father been looking for you. He been saying, sooner or later, my child's coming home. Sooner or later, they're going to come to their senses. Sooner or later, they're going to run out of their own way, and they're going to come back to my way. Bible says that he was still off. His father saw him. He was filled with compassion. You mean he not mad? No. God was sitting there waiting for you to come to your senses. He says, I'm not mad at you, and you just didn't know no better. I'm I'm still here waiting for you and all I need you to come back he ran saw his sons threw his arms around him and kissed him go ahead after he kissed him next verse next verse he kissed him and he said the father's servant quick bring the best robe put it on him put a ring on his finger put saddles on his feet bring the fatted calf and kill him you mean God I got in my own way and when I came back you threw me a party High five your praise partner and tell him God's so happy that you turned around that he's throwing you a party. Now where the party starters at, can you lift up your voice and give God a shout? He said, bring the fatty calf. Kill it. Let's have a feast. Let's celebrate. Let's have a feast. Let's celebrate. He says, for the son of mine that was dead is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they begin to celebrate. So the son, he went away. He got up. He came to himself and he returned to his father. The father said, I'm so glad you home that I'm about to throw you a party. You left with one thing, but you're coming back with multiple things. Because you learned how to repent, I went shopping for you. I went was waiting for you to return because I knew sooner or later you was going to come back home and I've helped everything that I assigned to your life. I've been holding it. I've been holding it, but I wasn't going to give it to you before you was time because I needed you to come back so I can show you what I needed you to do. So you took one thing, God say, I got 10 things. If you come back with your one thing, I'll restore you with 10 things. I won't hold it against you. I won't talk about you. I'm a celebrate I went shopping I threw your party give some give God a, a sound of glory and a sound of praise he saw him he saw him he ran into him he threw his arms around him he kissed him he kissed him he put a robe on him he put a ring on his finger he sandals on his feet fed him celebrated spoke a word over him he did all this stuff he said, you took one thing, 
but when you came back I was holding your stuff see when you let go of the spirit of entitlement God say God say I'll I'll hold everything that I signed for you and I'll restore you like I never like you never lost three things for ten things I did three things he did ten things all he was waiting for me to do was these three things so he can do these ten things if you do these three things God said I'll do these ten things because what I signed for you can't be belonging to anyone else because it has your name on it can you lift your hands and begin to worship a God that never leaves you nor forsakes you that loves you and that protects you and even though you thought you got it all he said I got more in store for you give thanks give thanks give thanks to the God of heaven why? because his love endures forever the wonderful thing about repenting the wonderful thing about re repenting is that when you turn back to God, He restores you. Like you're never lost, like you're never left. Can you take a moment and lift your hands and just where you are privately, release to God. Sorry, God. I repent. Restore me. I trust your process. I won't be in a hurry. I won't be in a rush, even if I feel like you made me wait. If he's making you wait, if he's making you wait, wait. If he make you wait, wait. Because it will be worth the wait. If you ran out on your own, thank God that his love endures forever. All you got to do is turn around. Come to your senses, get up, go to the Father. I'm out of time. Lift your hands all over the room. Let me pray with you. Father, help us to trust your timing. Help us to trust your plan. Not to be frustrated against our own calendar or even our own peers that try to put pressure on us to make premature decisions. It doesn't give us a license to be lazy. We should be, do everything that you want us to do, but God, we won't force your hand. We won't ask for what belongs to us before time. We're so glad that you don't hold it against us. But when we come to our senses, get up and turn to you, you restore us like you never left. Thank you for the 10 things for my three things. I said, thank you, Lord, for the 10 things to my three things. You ought to lift your hands way up high and receive it all. Come on, way up high, way up high. Get the guilt off you. Get the condemnation off you. Get the shame off you. Say, God, I thank you for restoring my soul. Putting me back like I never left. Putting me back like I never lost. And I trust your process. Clap your hands and give them praise and glory. Come on. You ought to praise God like he didn't hold a grudge against you. <laughs> Woo! You think this story is about the son, but it's really about the father. The story is not about the son, it's about the father. I learned this story, I learned this story was about the father when I had to live it. When I, you, know, you know, when I moved here, I taught you how my, my oldest son thought this was like the worst decision that I could have ever made for his life. He was mad. His infrastructure, his friendships, his relationships, his, his hookups, his connections, everything was in the city that he was raised in. So moving him and pulling him out of that at 20, 21 years old, he was just, he had an attitude every day. I tried to show him, I'm trying to give you a better life. I'm trying to put this up, I'm trying to set some stuff up for you. I just want to do it my way. 
use me against them. I'm your son. What you think? I'm your son. That's how you raised me. How you talk. Say, I'm your son, Dad. It's hard. I was holding on to him with a grip. I talked to my dad. My dad was like, he is your son. <laughs> my father had to remind me of being his. I like, yo, I know you think you got it together now, but you was that dude. Hold it, the more you hold on to him, the, the harder the grip is. He going to fight you because he's your son. I called Pastor Hannah. I said, bro, this thing breaking my heart. I think I cry every day. For about six months, Pastor Hannah was like, bro, we can't, we can't hold on to him. He's going to come to his sisters. Don't worry about it. He said, we're just going we gonna, to we gonna cover him in prayer, and we're going to pray that four things don't happen to him. He said, them four things that you, that's real hard to recover from. We're going to pray he don't, he don't get killed. We're going to pray he don't go to jail. He asked me, he said, what's the four things you want? I said, that he don't get killed, that he don't go to prison, that he don't get on drugs, and that he don't have no baby with no Philistine woman. Almost everything else you can recover from, but them four things right there, they set your life back for 18 years. So he said, we're just going to pray. We're, gonna, we're not going to fight it. So we covered him in prayer. Every day I cried and prayed. I cried and prayed. Don't let him go to jail. Don't let him... No Philistine woman. You know, my wife, she was echo shanta basat. <laughs> Get them nasty girls away from him, Lord. Take kata. <laughs> Y'all ain't heard a prayer till you heard a mama pray. My wife surgical with that thing. She was saying all kind of stuff I thought you couldn't even talk to God about. Ain't nothing open that night but by, besides legs after midnight, Lord. Close every leg that's open. I was like, yes, Lord? <laughs> we went through the process and just let him go. We let him go. We cried. We tried to call him. He wouldn't answer back. He was away. He was living his life, turning up. We was calling, reaching. He wouldn't come. We had a staff meeting. And the staff meeting, Pastor Hannah got this prayer book. He pulled out this prayer book. He asked everybody in the room, put something in the prayer book. I'm just telling y'all what I put in this book. Don't be trying to get in this book neither. You're already in there, okay? Don't be coming. You're already in there. He said, whatever I put in this book, for God answers. He said, what does everybody want? I was like, Bro, I don't want nothing for me. I just want my son to come home without them four things. <laughs> he put his name in the book. I trust the time and the God. Next week, my son just showed up at church on the weekend. I didn't even know he was coming. He just popped up. What's up, Dad? Next weekend, he came back again. Next weekend, he came back again. Then he started talking. We sat down. As you know, I, I get it. I want to move back home. I come back home. I was like, I was like, well, we can talk about it. <laughs> On the inside, I, was like, <laughs> I said, we can talk about it, son. You know, that's what, he said, I learned some stuff. I see what you meant. I understand. I got tired of sleeping on couches. You got all this that you didn't made and set up for me. Here it is. What I'm gonna do? We had, gave him some suggestions, school, sound, lights, music, barber college, all kind of stuff he was like, I'm going to get into. His life accelerated. Came back home. My role was just to sit on the porch and remain open. I didn't give him a lot of fluff. I didn't give him a lot of talk. I just sat on the porch and remained open for when I'm coming home. He came home. I took my whole family on a trip because we had to cut the fatted calf and we had to go, we had to throw a celebration and we threw a celebration because my son was home. And we weren't tripping about the process because everybody has to go through a process. And I can't save you from your process.
And the same God that saved me is the same God that can save you. Why don't we let our children grow up and don't hold their decisions against them? This story ain't about the son. It's about the father. Anybody thankful that the father still loves you? And that he's been waiting for you to turn around. That he don't hold your dumb mistakes against you. Can you thank him for his everlasting love? Father, we seal this with a spirit of promise. In Jesus' name. Everything was waiting for you to turn around. I want to say publicly, thank you, Larry, for giving my son a scholarship to Barber College. <laughs> You was about to go out there and have to pay for it. All you had to do was come home and God gave it to you for free. Favor. Somebody under the sound of my voice, at least three people said, I've been waiting to come back home. I thought I was too ashamed. I was too guilty. I thought I did too much. I thought God didn't love me no more. He didn't want me. God said, come to your senses. Come to me. I got you. I'm going to restore you. I'm about to do more in the next three months than you think you lost in the last nine but I need you to come. I need you to come to your senses, get up and come to the Father and I got you. If you're here, come now quickly, move. Come on, don't vacillate, don't complain. I don't care how long you've been, I don't care if this is your first Sunday back in church all year, it don't even matter. God say, I got you. I've been waiting for you to come home. I've been waiting for you to come home. I've been waiting for you to come home. I don't care if you just got out of prison, out of jail. I don't care if you just got out of a divorce. I've been waiting for you to come home. I don't care if you was in a club last night. I was waiting for you to come home. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you did. I've been waiting for you to come home. I, I've been waiting for you to come home. I've been waiting for you to come home. I've been waiting for you to come home. I got you. I got you. I've been waiting for you to come home. Ten things for your three things. I've been waiting for you to come home. Get the guilt up. Get the shame. Get it off you. I've been waiting for you to come home. All I need you to do is surrender and say yes. Come now. Come now. Come now. Come now. Today is your day of deliverance. Today is your day of restoration. I got you. I got you. In the balcony, I got you. Online, I got you. Wherever you are in the room, I've been waiting for you to come home. Can you clap your hands and give God praise? Somebody shout at them and say, welcome home. Come on, shout at them and tell them, welcome home. We're so glad you, you we're so glad you're back. We're so glad you got God got some new clothes for you. He got some money for you. He got a job for your relationships, opportunities. He's been waiting for you to come home. Can we give God a praise right there? Please follow Pastor Tom. He's gonna walk with you to the room so we can get your information and make sure that you're in the right location. Somebody give God praise. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> He's been waiting for you to come home. He's been waiting for you to come home. He's been waiting for you to come home. Tag three people around you and tell them, I'm home now. Come on, Sophia. I'm home now. I'm home. I'm home now. 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 waiting for you to come home. Sophia, home now. I'm home now. Welcome home. Welcome, welcome. He's been waiting for you to come home. Waiting for you to come home. <laughs> turn, turn. He's been waiting for you to come home. I'm home now, God. And I'm never leaving again. Hey! He's been waiting for you to come home. Everything is waiting for me. Everything is waiting for me. Everything. He's been waiting for you to come home. Everything is waiting for me. Everything is waiting for me. Everything is waiting for you to come home. Everything is waiting for me. Everything is waiting for me. He's been waiting for you to come home. Come home. Come home. Come home. Come home. Church. 
trust your timing, God. I trust your timing. I crush pride. I crush the spirit of entitlement. So I can receive everything you have for me. Everything is waiting for me. Everything is waiting for me. At home, get your offering ready. My offering. My offering, back to God. My offering, back to the Lord. My tithe is 10%. He only asked me for 10 and let me keep the 90. But I gotta be a good steward over it so I can multiply it, 90%. I'm gonna multiply. It starts off with my tithe, tithe is 10%. How many of you know tithing is not your issue? It's not my issue. I'm a tither. And then your offering is over and above your tithe, over and above your tithe. Say, God, here's my gift. My gift to you. Twenty-five, fifty, a hundred dollars. Sacrificially, I give back to you. I know it's coming back to me. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. I will not run out. Increase in harvest. My tithe, my offering over and above my time. Online, don't leave before you give. So will you grow in the building? So will you grow? Y'all ready? Y'all ready to give? To the God that gave you so much. When you're ready, stand on your feet, lift your offering up high. Four ways to give in the building, three ways to give online. Lift your gift up high. You will not run out. I will not run out. I'm connected to God. He's my source. Everything is waiting for me. For me to come home. When we sow, we say. What we say? I'm a tithe and a gift. Bless beyond measure. I have more than enough. I'm living in my. I'm living in E. How long you living? How long? For the rest of my life. Y'all receive that? Somebody need to stay for the next service. Pastor Hannah's coming to preach at 9.30. And then after that, coming to preach at 12.30. Thank you very much. 7.30 for three consecutive Sundays in the morning. I'll see y'all again in November, all right? <laughs> Somebody that's watching at home, get up and get dressed and come home. He's been waiting for you to come home. God bless you. See you later. Pastor Hannah's on the altar for any out-of-town guests and myself. We're standing here to greet you. Welcome home. Welcome home. Waiting for you to come. Waiting for you. Waiting for you. Waiting for you. He's waiting for you. Waiting.